for joining virtually. I'm just <clears throat> coming off two days live here in Barcelona at the, the live conference, which is great. Uh, but nice to uh, be able to share virtually as well. Um, yeah, so as Sarah mentioned, I'm based in Munich. Uh, just a, a little bit more about me. Um, I, I've been in HR for a long time. Actually, it seems like about 100 years, but uh, it's been a, it's been a long and fun journey through a lot of uh, functional areas and a lot of leadership uh, areas and different uh, areas, different functions, different uh, scopes. Um, had the pleasure of working on three different continents. Um, I, I came here and actually moved into a strategic uh, HR business partner role and uh, then moved through through that uh, function in a variety of different organizations of the company and really learned a lot about, uh, of course, the business leadership teams. And then about six years ago, I was asked to take on a couple of global teams. Uh, one of them was the global HR reporting team. And part of the mission there was to bring analytics into HR at Nokia. And that's when uh, I have to say the fun really started. So we began, I'll share a little bit about our journey, um, share with you some of the use cases, as you see from the title, that are helping support the business and drive business success, but then also our more uh, frequent move into uh, supporting the employee journey for success uh, as well. And these will be using a little more of our advanced analytics applications. So hopefully we'll give you some inspiration uh, on the art of possible and at the end free to to ask questions I do we do a lot of with metrics all of us in the analytics space uh, I have one overarching metric for most things and that's time well spent so was it time well spent and I will bring that metric back at the end of this session all right so let's get started a little bit about Nokia um, as you can see, we're, we're quite large, approximately 90,000 employees, but we're very distributed over 130 countries of the globe. Um, we are a network infrastructure provider, a cloud network provider. We're, we're heavy in, in data. We do big data for a living. Um, and we do not make cell phones anymore. <laughs> so um, with that, uh, let me just move into a little more on our on our journey. And these are pillars that I felt were significant sort of transformations with us in, in our stages of maturity, and they build on each other. I mean, they the, the, the first one continues into the second one, and the second continues into the third one, hand and, but then there are new things that come with each of these pillars. We started in 2018, as I mentioned, uh, we had a huge acquisition uh, company that was uh, doubled our size in, in 2016-17. And only in 2018 could we get some unified data and we re really started the journey. That's where I began. Um, started taking a look around uh, the fundamental question, how do we get more value out of our data? And for me, visualization of our data sets and things and our scorecards and our 50 page PowerPoint decks was the way to go. So uh, brought in a contract data scientist and pirated an IT guy from us that was a Power BI savvy. We are a big Microsoft shop, as I found out in this journey on visualization uh, platforms, and that is the, the way we went. And then we started uh, after the visualization of all of our main scorecards and some of our other fundamental reporting into more advanced reporting to really focus on the analytic team structures. These were very fragmented. We were finding out as we went along, lots of people throwing out lots of things and their capability was also beginning to increase. We were the central team, so we sort of corralled them. I corralled them in a biweekly meeting of all the creators and then had another biweekly on opposite weeks uh, with the users. And this forum went on for about eight months and was super helpful for us to get aligned. And then we had to really look at our engagement model with the business because we realized that the fragmentation was really doing a, a disservice to their understanding and, and becoming a more feedback oriented engagement model. Then <clears throat> COVID period, um, our capability had really increased quite a bit. The team had grown. Uh, this was sort of a claim to fame space for us. We were able to pull up things uh, to support the executive leadership team through the pandemic uh, that, were, that were pretty impressive, not only inside, but outside the world uh, looking in by using variety of data, uh, not only HR data, but overlaying virus data with our workforce, bringing in site data, bringing in traveler status, bringing in pulse surveys and well-being, all in a unified panel in Power BI, but also really began to focus on the literacy of both the users, our user community, 
which as we know, a lot of people get into HR because they don't like data. And so it's a bit of a struggle uh, to really get them in a mindset of how the data can uh, help them. Coming out of the business partner world, I knew what was missing and I knew what was needed. and I knew it was important to help drive success of the function. And we started on a campaign with new use cases that were coming to be uh, to, to coming from the business and from, from the HR leaders. And then you see in 2022, 23, we were actively started in 21, actually building the HR data lake, which I'll share a little more on this. It's the key to our success uh, to move rapidly. We do everything in house. Um, and then we got into the machine learning platform environment using big data, and this brought in all sorts of new applications and uses for us, which I'll share. And now as we get into 2024, we move more into mm, less, um, less, less focus on analyst insights and more focus on executive insights. And this is packaging across domains in our dashboards to tell the story for executives, but now also simplifying what we have. We realize we really need to simplify the user experience, the user interface and the usability and get into generative AI, which we are using now for large language models for mapping skills, adjacency, as well as sentiment analysis and other things from our survey. So um, we did need a repository. We have quite a portfolio that we are supporting across the business. Um, so my team really is, is focused on multiple domains. As you see on the top, we built this handy app last year, uh, I guess last summer, where you can people can go in and this is also um, managing access as well. If you have access, you will get it for your respective domain or, or area of responsibility. Or if you don't have access, you won't see it, but you could request it. So you see here some of the portfolio elements in the workforce space. Some of these are strategic, some are tactical, some are operational. And that is the same for the other domains of talent attraction analytics. That's highly operational, the recruiters, and we hire about 10, 8,000 people a year, uh, use this routinely. They rely on it. Um, you see all of your learning, um, reporting and analytics activity, consumption, competency assessment, reporting, all these sorts of things. You've got uh, health, safety, security. You've got your sentiment analysis and analytics, which is your surveys, pulse surveys, and a variety of other data sources related to employee sentiment. But you'll see here, I'll focus on some of the things in the workforce space, um, mainly in some of the more forecasting, predictive, and, and newer internal movement models that, that we have. And then take you into, uh, into the employee experience side of things where we have really moved over this last year uh, to support that. So it's a bit, uh, you know, uh, simplified schematic, but it's understandable. This is uh, really our key to success, and this is our integrated HR data platform um, in an Azure cloud based data lake. And then that flows to an analytic services layer and then your power BI for for user front end um applications and we are a big power bi shop i think uh, microsoft or i mean uh, nokia is now the number five user of power bi in the world i had one of my teammates ask who do you think number one is and i said probably microsoft um but anyway so you see here on the, on the left hand i don't want to spend too much time but on the left hand side here we had like a lot of big companies have without an integrated hcm um have a lot of distributed data systems for different functions. We had core SAP on premise. We had um, success factors for compensation and succession planning. We had Taleo for recruitment. We have Cornerstone for our learning management system. We have Qualtrics for surveys. We have work human for recognition and uh, sales performance management and all these things. And these are all these have now all been dropped in. Uh, in partnership with our HR IT group and, and our IT systems organization into this data lake and we can pull seamlessly across it. This has enabled great uh, ability to generate different insights by stitching together different data and even building practical things, which even only a year, year and a half ago, we built in a Power BI front end, which is the, the people manager dashboard. So you can go in, this is automated, it's refreshed daily. And you can see all sorts of attributes of your team that, uh, as you see here, you can look at uh, the demographics of the team. You can look at compensation history, position history, learning history, flexible working time, 
They can look at recruitment activity for their organizations. And now we've added in the skills portal, which this is new and I will share with you later in the presentation. But this goes to show the flexibility and we can continually add domains to this that are panels that uh, really make a manager's life easy. I as a manager had to go into three systems to get this profile of my employees and now I can do it very, very simply. And we have 7,500 managers, so they are all applauding when this came. So, whoops, let me go back. So as mentioned, we have areas where we've really started in our analytics journey, a lot of companies do, to focus on the, helping the business understand data that will help them solve business problems, people-related business problems, or make better people decisions. And we are in the same as, so we have a broad portfolio that are really uh, focused on the business support, strategic workforce planning, trending, what has happened, what is the current situation, what's likely to happen. Um, and some of these, these uh, elements are shown here. For example, this is our flagship product that's evolved into a very robust and, mo and highly used um, analytics product for the HR partners, the HR community, and we do, we have democratized this to layer three leaders and above in our company. They have direct access to this. And you can see all the, the sort of different metrics and um, highly sliceable and diceable. Um, and <clears throat> it is used routinely, right? It, it's uh, very, very effective at looking at trends and, and looking at segments and segmentation. I mean, we can tell you the attrition rate of a cloud, a female cloud engineer at a building in Chennai at any point in time. Uh, but it gets across a lot of different metrics you see here across the top. This one uh, came out relatively new uh, about a year ago. Uh, one of the team members we really said as a, you know, we, I know all the attributes of the people coming into the company and all the people leaving, but we have no idea what is, who is moving inside the company. And I can tell you from a business partner standpoint or a talent management standpoint, nobody had any view of this. And we have lots of openings and lots of movement. So it was a bit complicated, but we built a way to see all the movement that's going on inside the company and why it's happening. Or is this involuntary due to mass reorgs, which Nokia seems to love, or is it voluntary movement, you know, through the RR process, internal marketplace? Is it some system change or independent change? Um, and then then started getting into uh, the attributes of the move. Are they promotions? Are they laterals? Are they um, same area, different areas and things? And then the attributes of the mover, which was very important by gender or, or tenure or job grade performance and potential and really looking in detail at the, at the movement in the company. So again, a very valuable view that's really starting to uh, get you know attraction with our talent management folks to say, is this in line with our talent strategy uh, as we go forward? Also for headcount planning between business groups. A couple others here, you'll see uh, the attrition uh, prediction model. This has been evolved over the last, it's been evolved over the last couple of years. Um, and it's really become quite robust to segment the risk by various segments of the population, looking at a lot of different factors feeding into a machine learning model and a platform. We use NIME. I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. And it's factoring out the, the main influencers by segments of levers and people that stayed versus people that left and coming up with really the uh, the risk profile for, for people and segmenting it by geographies and business groups and roles and gender and positions and salary ranges and all these things. Um, and then uh, aging diversity, we got into said, hey, we, we really don't have a good way. We don't know why we haven't done it. We could always do it um, to look at how many people are going to be leaving us with an aging workforce. We're an old company, 150 years. Not all our employees are 150 years, but <laughs> we have pockets of aging. And we then started showing the insights of what was happening in, in between from now, now and 10 years out. What can you expect? You can slide one, two, three, four, five, ten years, and you can see pretty accurately who's going to be leaving due to retirements only in this uh, particular view, um, but also the attributes that are going with those retirees, their functions, their tenure, their their roles, their job grades, and the skills or competencies that are going with those. 
um, and, and then see the impact also on the workforces from a diverse age diversity perspective at large to know where we want to renew and how we can renew and, and really help support that view. Then we get into um, the people focus, which is really more supporting looking at how we can use analytics to support the employee journeys and experience. We have a new HR strategy uh, about a year and a half ago or more, a little over almost two years, I guess. Uh, very simple, but but very effective. And these are the main pillars with sub pillars underneath. But we started asking a lot of questions. How can we help support this strategy? Mainly in the in two pillars we'll focus on first, right? Growing together and experiences everything. And the team, we just started looking at how we could best do this. What what techniques do we have? What data could we use to help support these this journey? And uh, sure enough, we're able to spin up something relatively small period of time, about 10 months from concept to launch um, with a couple of people supplemented with some uh, student technicians. Oops, sorry. Uh, I'm accidentally clicking. And we created this front end portal called My Growth Portal. It's very nicely done, very easily laid out. It is automated, it is updated daily, and this will um, help employees. They can go in and look at uh, job opportunities for their interests, or they can look at the optimized career paths for their current role or different roles. They can look at career paths that are linked with current roles or or adjacent roles they could move into. They can look at a lot of different matching options here that are provided to them. And with the um, with the job matching, sort of like LinkedIn, you'll also get a push if you subscribe to it. Say this job is just posted that matches your skills interest profile. Um, you might want to take a look and then you can apply right there. And it really is a huge enhancement in experience but also in targeting its personalized job recommendations or training recommendations. And it's using only your data. You can see the adoption here, a uh, very big hit. So about 40,000 new users just in the sense of since the launch and over a million page hits. Um, and this is getting more and more robust as we evolve our data sources. A little more about about that, for example, for those that are a little more technically oriented, this is how we are doing it. We are feeding lots of different data into the machine learning platform, running through the models and algorithms to build the recommendations and the matches. We are taking a, a, a common framework of competencies and our skills from all of the jobs you've ever held, from all of the training you've ever taken, from all of the jobs you've ever applied for and using this as a starting profile and taking the same uh, mechanics and scraping all of the jobs that we have and all of the training that we have to parse out which training is most relevant to these particular competency developments and optimizing the path. So if you see here, uh, again, it's a it's a, a little struggle to see, but I just wanted to show you some actual screenshots. This is real, and this is right. You can uh, select what you want to do and take a look. Here you see the jobs here, um, some that are new, and and you can go in there and get lots of information about the job itself, the profile. Um, you you can get trending information on jobs. So we have a, a historical trending on the jobs and the and the competencies that are trending for internal hiring by Nokia. We have a lot that are trending up, but we have roles that are trending down. So this gives a good indication of what's hot and what's not. Um, you can, so you can get lots of insights about the jobs themselves as well as the profiles, but you could also go in and, and actually end up applying to one of these right through the same portal, which takes out a lot of other job uh, uh, posting process uh, steps from our previous setup. And here you see sort of an optimized learning path with the selection based on data scientists that talks about these are optimized learnings for various competencies or various roles. And you see on the left hand side, you have different tabs. These can be current both for jobs and for for training and development. These can be in your current role or they can be for desired roles or even recommendations on next role. 
um, and you can get the same insights across across the board there. And again, these are some, you know they are menu based, drop down driven, and um, and they change over time as uh, the jobs come and go, or new training may, may become more relevant would come into play here there. So you see this slide on the left, big survey, right? LinkedIn knows more about our employees than we do. And we happen to believe that. So we embarked on this journey in parallel to say we need a way to build in a skills repository and inventory of our employees in this My Growth Portal, which will then also feed the recommendation engine as well and make it even more and more accurate and robust. So we did. In our Cornerstone Learning Management System, we built a skills portal and we start with the profile of skills that we have scraped, meaning making inferences. If you had this role with these competencies and you were in this you probably may have these competencies, but you can also then select and add your own sort of in with LinkedIn um, because we have, we don't know what roles you might have had in other companies or new joiners or other things. So this is a very good starting point for us to try and starting co collecting skills data for for the employee base. And <clears throat> as you see, uh, the you can go into a skills library. We have been using large language models now to help pare down the, the, the database of skills that start from common consumption, which can be a cornerstone database. It can be all sorts of other external sources of data on skills, and you end up with 50,000 of them. And then it's determining the ones to getting down to 10,000 at one point to, to even a lower level that are most relevant for our company and at a reasonable level that we can manage and, and make usable. And <clears throat> then you have, we built uh, the reporting for portal for the line managers. So when you, what I wanted to mention about the, the employee portal I forgot to mention, it's all your data, only you can see it when you log in. So we had a very light touch workers council process for this. Nobody else can see it. Only you. With the skills, if you agree to populate your skills, you also agree your manager only can, can view the results. You can also send your proficiency rating on the skills to your manager for co-rating or peers for other multi-rater input. And these will all appear and your manager can use these not only for the skills you think you have, but there's a portal where you input skills you want to develop. And this becomes very helpful for managers in their discussions on developing their employees and directions they want to go or can can rec help recommend on the career pathing. So um, this, by the way, is now on that people manager dashboard. So as we said, we can build things and, and add to it. Lastly, there will be. Uh, the technical career path, this is for SMEs and individual experts that don't want to move into management per se, but want to advance in the technical way. And there's some additional insights here and, and other more robust views specific to roles that we've, we're have we adding in time by time. And then the, 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 the interesting piece here is we built an inspiration map, which shows you where you can move adjacently in technical moves because we've, we have mapped job movement history and know that it can be done and also how high you can go in these roles and who has them. The colored dots are our different business groups. So if you wanna move into from technical sales to product management, that's doable and here's who has it. These are inspiration maps, we call them, and they're really, I think, really pretty cool. So I know we don't have a lot of time and it's a lot of information, but hopefully gives you a real view sort of in practical terms with, <clears throat> with screenshots what, what we are doing and some sort of the art of possible. Um, and we will continue the journey for sure. And it will get a little more exciting um, as we just rolled out our HCM, which is Oracle Cloud, and we'll see what this does to us. But anyway, <clears throat> quick question, was it time well spent? <laughs> I mean, for me, it certainly was. Um, so, so, David, thank you so much. I loved the 
the depth you were able to achieve with your with your integrations and your and your um, dashboards. It was really impressive. Um, let me let me just ask you a few questions from the chat because we only have a few minutes, but I think there's some good ones in there. So the first is a short one. Um, what people analytics platform do you use and what machine learning platform do you use? And I think you might have mentioned this, but maybe you can remind us. Yeah, we're using for the visualization and some now advanced analytics applications in the in the application. It's Microsoft Power BI. So this is the, the visualization platform, but also the data lake provisioning is an analytics layer that, that feeds up to us. And for the machine learning, we're using NIME. And we're using that uh, instead of Microsoft, which has their their machine learning platform only because that platform was not ready as everything was rolling out in in, in mass and we didn't want to wait. So we started actually with a nine platform, but may end up going to to Microsoft. But for now, it's a nine server environment. Got it. Great. Hey, um, hey, yeah. Maybe you could spell that for us in the chat afterwards. Um, yeah. And and one last very quick question. Um, so there was a few comments around data quality, and especially with such a large organization with perhaps many operating companies, how do you ensure data quality across the entire data lake? So uh, you know, and, and it, it's 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 key. I mean, it's it's pivotal, right? It's table stakes. I happen to inherit of the group that was extremely adept at data reporting and, and almost data engineering quality, right? And they were very adept at running quality check scripts and, and snapshot compares and really looking for sources of errors and then correcting them quickly. We created a we created a mechanism where um, we found all the data with the problems. We ran a big study over a three or four week period and collected all the problems. We found the owners, we found who created the problem, who's the data owner, if it's a compensation issue, somebody's hired in, in Hungary and they're paid in US dollars, this is a disconnect, right? Who owns the data set, it's the compensation people. So we got the data owners to take, fess up to their ownership, but what we then used is uh, robotic process automation, so bots um, to, uh, to data check this routinely in the background and when their routine fixes it automatically fixes them but we have a pretty strong quality gate um, that's done through automated scripting that's checking for this and it really keeps the data really quite clean for us still you have problems i mean is there's a human input and there's where you have to check yeah, I, I can imagine. Well, let me just say thank you so much for sharing uh, your journey with us. I think it was very insightful and for me, aspirational. So um, I want to thank you again for joining us. And actually, now we will transition on to our next speaker. All right. Hi, David. Thank you. All so. Right.